and welcome tonight to a really special event for 5 by 15. Um, we're doing a complete episode of our events on the subject of food and in particular the subject of the future of food but this isn't about the long-term future it isn't also about whether we're going to all be eating impossible burgers or proteins that are made in petri dishes i'm talking about the future that's in our hands and over the next few months because we really are at a very critical moment in the question of food, the question of food politics, and how we're going to eat in the future. Now, as we all know, COVID-19 has thrown food into very sharp relief. Uh, not The news is not good from more or less every way you look at it, except for the fact that the supermarkets did keep us fed. But for the poorest in our society, this has been a really, really tough time. And of course, as all of you know, the people who were suffering ill health, mostly as a result of food, mostly as a result of obesity, got struck down by COVID and had much, much more serious impacts. And in fact, all of that is leading to a lot of political discussion. So as children go back to school this week as well, the question of school meals is huge. We all know the wonderful work that Marcus Rashford has done in highlighting this and in helping move the agenda. So there's hundreds of you out there joining us online and I'm thrilled to see that the chat function is already absolutely buzzing with about 30 or 40 things coming in of people saying hi, they're pleased to be here, please keep that going. But I'm incredibly thrilled that we've got four extraordinary speakers to talk to these big issues. The format of the evening is incredibly simple. The speakers are going to talk for about eight minutes each. I'll introduce each of them as we go along. And then at the end, we're going to have questions. Now, in terms of the questions, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So please put your questions there. Please don't shove them necessarily into the chat because there's so much chat, we may have a real problem in finding them later. And that would be a great shame. So just briefly before we call our first speaker, um, just a couple of thoughts. Food is everywhere. It's not just about the fact of the meal on the table in front of you when you eat, or indeed in your lap or in the supermarket or wherever it is. It is everywhere and it affects everything we do. It affects the way we farm, the way we use our land. As many of us know, this has led to massive biodiversity loss as we've attempted to grow more and more on less and less space. And we've used increasing amount of chemicals to do that. It's affected what happens in our guts, which Tim Spector, our speaker, has really brought to the fore. When we eat foods that aren't good for us, that aren't natural, as my mother used to say, stuff that doesn't agree with us. Food also really impacts us when we're on low incomes. And as we've seen through the pandemic, and as you'll hear in a short while, this has been very tough. But finally, of course, food is a big political issue, which is coming to the boil this autumn. Parliament came back yesterday, Lords came back today, and it's really kicking off. We've got the Agriculture Bill, we've got the Environment Bill, and we've got all these trade bills which are coming, which are going to affect our departure from the EU and the kinds of food that we're going to be eating in the future. So in the next hour, we're going to be taking you through all of this, and I hope that by the end of it, you will have got our passion about food, learned about the importance of it. As I see it, I think if we could fix the way we eat and ensure that everybody had good food, which was affordable and accessible wherever they lived, then we would have fixed a lot of the problems of the world. Now, on to our speakers. It's been 75 years since we had a national food strategy. There've been lots of plans. There's been things called visions. There has been uh, reports endlessly, but we've never had something that is absolutely comprehensively called a food strategy. So I'm unbelievably pleased that Henry Dimbleby is going to be kicking off tonight's session. Henry was one of the founders of Leon many years ago. Since he left, he wrote the school food plan, which has been extraordinarily important in terms of quality of food and availability of food to kids in schools. And for the last couple of years, he has been working on a national food strategy commissioned by the government. He published his part one in July, which was amazing and really interesting. And he's going to talk to us about that and where he goes next, what we should all do. And I rather suspect that he will also touch on some of the issues to do with COVID. So thank you very much and over to Henry. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, I'm going to start uh, in, in part one of the National Food Strategy, which 
uh, we published in late July, uh, I told a story about how we got the food system we did. And it is a story of determination and ingenuity. It's a story of heroism, actually, and a story of the saving of billions of lives. And it's also a story of unintended consequences that lead to environmental destruction, ill health, and societal inequality. And I tell it uh, both as a cautionary tale and also as a tale of hope. And I briefly want to tell that story now before talking about the food strategy. After the Second World War in 1945, um, humanity faced an even greater existential threat. The global population had more than doubled over the last 150 years, from 1 billion to 2.5 billion. And thanks to advances in medicine and hygiene, scientists were predicting that an even bigger surge was to come. Within the next 100 years, they said, there would be 9 billion people on the planet. And the question was, how would we feed them all? In the past, we had dug up land uh, and basically the amount of food we produced from our soil had depended on how much land was farmed. At the beginning of the war, we produced 30% of our own food. By 1945, that had risen to over 40 and we'd done that by grubbing up hedges, digging more land, turning more land over to food production. But with that level of population surge, there wouldn't be enough land globally to feed us all, we would die, the scientists said. But the scientists hadn't reckoned with uh, an American botanist called Norman Borlaug, uh, who had grown up at a small farm in Iowa during the Great Depression. He had seen starving people begging on the streets, he'd seen food riots, and it had sent him on a lifelong mission to fight hunger. Um, and in 1944, he went to Mexico to uh, look at the agriculture there. And he was so shocked by what he'd seen, he wrote to his wife and said, these places have clubbed my mind. I don't know what to do, but we have to do something. Um, most of the population of Mexico, it was an almost feudal system, were scrabbling to make a living. Po starvation was um, frequent and common. And Borlaug, uh, basically spent his time in Mexico trying to grow a better yielding strain of wheat that stood up to Mexican conditions and resisted wheat rust, which was a disease that completely destroyed whole harvests of wheat. And he breeded hand tweezering off thousands of stamen, mixing pollens by hand, um, sleeping on the floor of his shed. He uh, finally created a, a form of wheat that radically changed the uh, landscape of Mexico for farming. In 1944, 60% of food in Mexico was imported. By 1956, Mexico was self-sufficient. And this was repeated uh, across the world, in India for rice, in China, uh, and as expected, the global population soared. In 1950, the average global life expectancy was 46, today it's 73. Uh, infant mortality has plummeted one in five, from one in five in 1950 to one in 20 now. There are more humans alive on earth than ever before, and yet famines this century are uh, recorded, have been recorded only in countries riven by war or governed by totalitarian regimes. So the uh, Hunger this century is a political issue, not an agricultural issue. But as so often happens, the solution to one problem creates others. As food increased, so we got heavier. And um, it wasn't just the supply. In the 70s, as we uh, be became much less active, manual jobs decreased. You know, even the window of our car now, we, we wind down with a button. Uh, companies learned how to market uh, the food that we crave to us. It's no surprise that in the UK, uh, you can buy 22 different kinds of Kit Kat because they are much easier to sell to us than, than runner beans. And so uh, diet related health became one of the major issues in life. And also, as we grew more food per hectare of land, we began to wipe out the wildlife in that land. In the UK, the doubling of the wheat uh, yields from 1970 has happened 
contemporaneously with the halving of the amount of birds. Across the world, the global food system is responsible for 20 to 30 percent of our greenhouse gases. Uh, it occupies half of our habitable land, uses 70 percent of our fresh water, causes three quarters of all water pollution, and is the biggest single loss by far to biodiversity. The way we produce our food is the mother of all sustainability issues. Now, why do I tell this story? Because I think it is a cautionary tale, but also we set out to do one thing with the food system and we can do it again if we choose what it is we want to do. I broke the, the strategy into two parts. So at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, we decided to uh, put the team working on food security. And when we came back, uh, I resolved to publish part one, which is a COVID response. And it focused very specifically on the generation of children uh, who it is now clear whose bodies and prospects are going to be marked by malnutrition through this disease. And it included a number of recommendations, three of which I'm delighted have been taken up by Marcus Rashford. And there's going to be a big campaign to get those over the line before October. And also some pretty um, uh, clear re re recommendations on trade, because uh, I think Tash is going to talk about this, but it makes absolutely no sense to improve the environmental footprint of our farming here in the UK, and then just to export that abroad, those problems abroad in, in the form of lower standard imports coming into this country. Part two, part one was very much a quick response. It was quite tactical. Part two, the intention is to be much more systematic. There'll be much more on health. There'll be much more on climate, on biodiversity, on data, and on science but it is going to be built around the recognition of these negative effects that the food system has on the rest of society. Negative externalities is the jargon. And the food system is riven with them, uh, both in health and in the environment. And what is extraordinary is that all economists agree that you need to build, in any free market, you have to build these externalities into the system. And yet in this country, not only are they not built in, they're not even measured systematically. And it seems to me that this is one of the most basic functions of government in a free market economy is to measure the harms that the market is doing to society more broadly and set out how it is building those harms into the system. This is going to involve uh, probably a government intervention, how we eat, what you and I eat, how we eat healthily, how we eat sustainably, that is probably one of the most personal relationships between government and the citizen. And therefore, we are going to be doing a lot of uh, dialogue. We're we'll creating a contract through deliberative dialogues, uh, talking to citizens across the country, so that when we make the recommendations, the government will know that they have the support of the citizenry. And part of this is to start a big national conversation which we will be doing in a month or so's time. So I'd finish by saying, uh, please, if you're interested, go to nationalfoodstrategy.org, read the strategy, but sign up. You can sign up to get involved because we need uh, as many voices as we can if we want to change the system as radically as we need to change it. Thank you. Henry, thank, thank you so much, Henry. That was fantastic. I really always am riveted by the story of Norman Borlaug. And I think that the, you know, you mentioned the phrase, the unintended consequences. And actually, the, the history of food is absolutely littered by them. I mean, including, of course, um, plastic, which at one point obviously seemed like probably such a good thing. Um, our next speaker is Dee Woods. Um, I can claim an interest here. Dee and I sat on the London Food Board together for some years, so I've known her of old. She's an award-winning cook, and she's an environmentalist and a food educator. And she's worked very much on the front line in communities and in uh, food banks. And she has really seen firsthand what effect COVID-19 had on the communities of Great Britain. And she saw very much where the food system did not work. So Dee advocates like we all do, for good food to be available for all. So over to you, Dee, and thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you, Henry, 
you know, we have had a discussion and there are parts of part one that I agree with and others that I don't. Um, food poverty is a fragmentation of poverty. All right, food poverty is a symptom of poverty and it is poverty that is driving hunger. And we have somehow lost our way in terms of just looking at hunger and thinking that food can fix it. So during this pandemic, um, on the ground, it was disastrous for many. Um, particularly in certain parts of the country, um, in rural areas, um, in Wales, Sheffield, so, so many different places that couldn't access food. So whilst, you know, there might have been some resilience within our supply chains and the supermarket system, it didn't work for everyone. Um, the hunger industrial complex of having surplus food to feed people didn't work either. So I, I can speak from my own experience of running a project in Northwest London. In the first couple of weeks, we saw our demand go from sort of 70 sort of food parcels and meals of around 150 increase by 300 percent and that has increased up to probably 700 percent now and people are falling through the gaps people who have no recourse to public funds people who are sleeping rough even people who the local authorities were putting up in hotels and hostels and other places weren't accessing food. So we found ourselves trying to access food from the surplus system, but also we were thinking, well, right, there must be other ways of, of accessing food. So we chose to work with community gardens, with local farmers, with sort of better food traders in London who consolidate, you know, organic food from farmers and market gardeners. And we had a combination of food that we bought, of food that was donated, and food that came from the surplus system. And still, that is not enough food. Um, from the very beginning, we had people crying, people breaking down, who had no money, people, elderly people who were stuck indoors and who had no support network, who had not eaten for days, calling us and saying, I haven't eaten for five days, I need help. We had young mothers breaking down because they couldn't access the voucher system, who couldn't access um, universal credits, um, weren't, couldn't get child benefit for whatever reasons and people just breaking down crying, people who had never thought they would end up using a food bank or a food aid project breaking down crying and I think our project works because we are no borders. We don't ask questions, we are no borders. You just show up and say you need food. Um, we try to support you in terms of your dietary requirements, um, in terms of cultural appropriateness and your family size. We do the best you can, we, we can, but we're seeing that food dwindling and we're seeing yeah, sort of donation fatigue people are tightening up their purses because as far as I, I see it, and I think a lot of us feel it on ground, we are in that period, that quiet period when the wave goes out before a tsunami. We are preparing ourselves for a tsunami of need on the ground when furlough ends, when more people lose their, their jobs, 
um, when more people, you know, come out of hospital without their, their support networks. And that was the other thing we found. So we weren't just providing food. We became social workers. We were mental health workers. Um, we had the NHS referring patients to us. And this was repeated up and down throughout the country. On the ground, we became more than just people providing food aid. And the good thing that has come out of that is that communities stood up, communities came together, communities volunteered, communities um, worked tirelessly and endlessly to support each other. But as some people are going back to work, that, that is going to get harder, even harder for us on the ground. And I don't know, right? What, what that future is, but food alone will not fix it. We need our government to take some responsibility and we need supermarkets and other people in food chain to take some responsibility as well in terms of providing fair wages, um, fair working conditions. And we understand that our, our, our economy has gone straight into a major downturn, you know, we are in a recession, but we need to be, be thinking differently, right? We need to be thinking differently and to be thinking differently about food because food is much more than a commodity. You know, food, food is life. It is the very essence of, of what we need to live. And without that, we will end up sick, our children are, are malnourished. Our elders are undernourished and malnourished as well. We need to be thinking differently about our systems and what we create whilst also dealing with those social inequalities. Thank you, Dee. That was fantastic and it was really powerful. I found, I could see that a lot of people were coming in on the chat and talking about the statistics that you mentioned. Just thank you from all of us for being there. And as always, it's left to charities to pick up the pieces. So our next speaker is Tim Spector, who's been on 5 by 15 before and is always completely wonderful. His first book was called The Diet Myth and he really has been one of the pioneers of understanding what food does to us, to our insides, to understanding the gut. He's also been very prominent through COVID as I'm sure many of you have seen and his new book, I think if I hold it up, will it appear, or I don't know, is that backwards, Spoon Fed and it's gone shooting up the bestseller charts and it's an absolutely terrific book and the subtitle says everything about it, which is why almost everything we've been told about food is wrong. And that affects every single part of the conversations we're having tonight. And I'm really thrilled that Tim has got the time to join us. He has a very exotic background uh, to his, um, his video screen, as you'll see in a minute. Tim, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and what I wanted to start with is, is what COVID has really taught us. And um, my book was written pre-COVID, but I think there are a lot of uh, lessons in there for us. But, um, my department was closed down at, uh, in mid-March and we were doing a lot of work on nutrition and nutrition apps. And I managed to convince the team working on the nutrition app at a company called Zoe, just a startup around the corner, to work with us uh, to get a COVID app together. And amazingly, they did it in four days. Amazingly, after uh, 48 hours, we had a million people download it. We now have uh, over 4 million people have downloaded this app, making it the biggest citizen science project uh, probably in the world, and certainly the biggest COVID one. And this has given us amazing insight, insights, and actually it was very heartwarming because people felt uh, that when they were ignored by government and uh, hospitals and GPs, they could tell people their problems uh, through the symptoms. And uh, many people have emailed me saying how it did help them and uh, things like the long-term problems of COVID have uh, been finally recognized and we were able to get some symptoms on the government 
list that they wouldn't otherwise have listened to. Um, COVID itself um, caused problems uh, in addition to where we were already. So we were already the, the most uh, obese nation in Europe and we did a survey and it turned out in the three months of lockdown, uh, we got even fatter and uh, we, uh, about 30% of the population had gained weight over this time and gained an average of around six pounds, which uh, is about three or four times more than you get over the Christmas break. And that's gonna be hard to lose. We also found that there were, the population divided into two groups, really. There was a group that actually, 20% uh, did actually manage to lose weight. And they're probably the ones you saw jogging in the parks and um, uh, making their own sourdough. And, uh, and the other group um, were losing weight. So it sounds like the disparities we had in our foods and our, and our diets were being exaggerated. And when we looked at who was losing, uh, who was gaining the most weight, we also saw there was a north-south difference, and it was greater in the north, greater in areas of deprivation. And it all started to fit into this, this general trend that we've been seeing, which is um, uh, very worrying, but it, it is linked, as we've heard, to um, uh, relative poverty, education, uh, access to, to good food and, uh, and, and other facilities. Now. Um, the why people were gaining weight they mainly described this as they were snacking more and uh, and they were snacking generally and eating ultra processed foods so um, in, in surveys the uk has come top uh, in the amount of ultra processed food it eats it eats over over 50 percent of meals are ultra processed by definition of um, something that can't be made from basic ingredients and has lots of different, uh, you know, around 10 different items in it. And you might think that's purely just down to, uh, you know, is that just uh, because we're not rich enough, like other countries like France? No, because Portugal, which is much poorer than us, uh, only has about 10% of its meals ultra processed. So. We're the most obese nation. We're also the one that eats the most ultra processed rubbish food. We also snack more than any other country. And you might say, why is this? Well, this is something I talk about a lot in the book. And I think it's, it, there's, as always, it's complex. Um, there isn't a one solution. Part of it is our lack of a food culture after the Second World War. Uh, everything got swept away. We didn't have that grandmother culture telling us how we should eat. How we should cook real food, telling our children exactly what vegetables look like. Um, but we also had a, a very active uh, food industry, uh, lots of factories, lots of industry, um, and supermarkets where uh, we get about 80% of our food from about just five shops. So we have a very different system to other countries. And this industry has had a major effect on, on keeping snack foods, ultra processed foods going. Um, they've blocked the extension of sugar taxes. They've, uh, they love uh, having these labels on foods. They've made us think that uh, we, we can eat healthily because it's got a healthy label on it, because it's got low fat or free from gluten, or uh, it's, uh, it's got some added uh, bad vitamins in it. And so they've perpetuated this myth and they fund a lot of the research that's gone in nutrition, uh, sadly, because the government doesn't fund enough basic research in universities and nutrition or in anywhere else. So they've filled the gap and uh, they've distorted the uh, evidence that we have for, for food uh, and distorted our ideas of what's healthy and unhealthy. And it was only last year that the first ever randomized trial of ultra processed food was carried out, uh, showing that the equivalent calories of processed and unprocessed give very different reactions in terms of your going back for more, eating more of it, because you've been chemically programmed to do that. And uh, the other thing that the industry um, 
have worked together with the government on is, is get us obsessed with calories. And this is a nonsense. Uh, we, uh, calories were very useful uh, after the world wars, when we were starving, when you had to get kids, make sure they had enough to stop them starving. But now we are in an under, under nutrition, but overfed state. So people are eating often too much bad food. Obviously, there are exceptions, as we've heard about. And, uh, uh, but overall, this is what's, what's happened. And people are obsessed with picking low calorie foods, which turn out to be ultra processed and full of other chemicals that are particularly bad for you. And we now know that um, in the COVID era, all these risk factors for disease, which are uh, having diabetes, being overweight, uh, living in deprived areas, all um, add up to having poor diets uh, and poor food and poor gut health. And we know that the two are now very much linked. If you eat rubbish food, you have a very poor health in your gut, your gut microbiome. This is basically a chemical factory and it just can't produce the good chemicals. And the reason it's important is that's key for your immune system. And so people with poor diets, poor gut health, have poor immune systems, they get more infection. And when they get infected, they, it lasts longer, they have more severe symptoms, they end up going to intensive care and dying more. So I think importantly, we're all gonna learn uh, by this bad experience about how important it is to feed ourselves properly for our general health and our immunity that we haven't thought about because we've only been obsessed with calories in, calories out, the pretense that we can measure uh, these things and that calorie controlled diets work. So um, this is something we have to break. The other thing is, is coming back to snacking again, um, comes back historically the fact we didn't used to have um, five or six meals a day as we now do here and in the US, uh, meal events as they're called by the industry. And we're told that we can have healthy foods because it's got fiber on the bar or extra protein. But, uh, and we've been told by the government that breakfast, for example, is very dangerous if you skip it. And of course, um, for most of us eating too much food, uh, it turns out that the new science shows that's not correct, that many people do better by having uh, two large meals a day rather than uh, four or five uh, smaller meals, even if the exact um, total is the same. Because uh, the idea that we were told that grazing is better than gorging is based on faulty data 30 years ago in nine people, and the new science simply says that we need to rest our guts, we need to be snacking less, uh, eating better food more often. So these are all uh, additional um, myths, um, perpet really exaggerated by the food companies with the help of government who seem to love having black and white guidelines for everybody. They'd love to say that there's 2,000 calories for the average woman and 2,500 for the average man. The fact is there is no such thing as the average person. Uh, we're all completely different. So um, there's many other myths out there. Um, diversity is the key. Um, we need to be eating many more types of plant. It doesn't matter if you're vegan or uh, you have other, or you have a little bit of meat. Um, diversity on the rest of the plate is what's important. So to summarize, no one size fits all. Uh, everyone is unique. We need to find out ourselves what suits us and we should try and regain our food culture by really educating everybody about the importance of food, going for quality, forgetting about food labels and the future is I think personalized nutrition. Thank you. Thank you so much Tim, that was, that was fantastic. Um, I can't uh, recommend your book too highly in fact all your work and thank you for everything we've done that was uh, i i'd never heard that really desperate expression a meal event um but i will will certainly not forget it now but so thank you and please buy tim's book we put the details up on the chat um our final speaker tonight is Ta tasha maya kakura and she is the co chair and co-founder of the youth board at bite back 2030 which is a 
company that Jamie Oliver started to bring youth into the food debate. Tasha is a shining example of everything one wants to see in younger people and having passion about food. She's going to talk to us specifically for not very long, but for about trade and why that matters because trade is, well, for a lot of people, maybe it's something you think is not too interesting, but in fact, it is very important and it's very important right now. So Tasha, thank you so much for being with us. Over to you. Fabulous. Thank you so much for having me. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, so I always get asked how I got into politics and into food. So I thought I'd start with that just before I get into the trade deals. Um, to keep it short and simple, so a couple of years ago, I, um, I self-sourced work experience with the director of public health for Lewisham at the time, who was Dr. Danny Rita. And this was at the same time that the government had published the 2016 Childhood Obesity Report and also the sugar tax was being introduced. And Danny said something that really struck, um, struck me, something that really stayed with me. He said, it's not that people have become lazier or greedier since the 1980s, early 90s. Instead, the environment in which people are growing up in has dramatically changed. And so when he said that um, as, a, in, as a response to the obesity problem, that's when I started to observe the food environment that I lived in. So I grew up in South London and my high street, I remember, was plagued with fast food shops and opportunities to get food that was not only healthy, but also affordable was very limited. And this was something that was very different uh, in comparison to when I lived in Zimbabwe. So before I migrated here, I remember fresh fruit and vegetables goals were being set up down my road every single day. It was the norm for me. Not only was it really cheap, it was very accessible. And so moving here and finding that my high street had six chicken and chip shops, all with the same men menu, same prices, it was really just absurd to me. And what we know is that uh, England's poorest areas are fast food hotspots with five times more outlets found in these communities than in the most affluent, affluent areas. And I think these health disparities are what fueled my passion for politics. And so fast forward to about a year ago, having been a debater throughout secondary school with an organization called uh, Debate Mate, my mentor said, oh, Jamie Oliver is on a 10 year mission to have childhood obesity by 2030. And essentially he's looking for a group of young people to form um, the youth board who will build a, move a movement to reshape the food system. And so that's how it got involved with Fight Back 2030. So we're a youth-led organization for young people, by young people who want to achieve a world where every child has the opportunity to thrive and be healthy no matter where they live. And we aim to do this by telling the truth about how the food system works. And we want to redesign it to put the health of young people at the forefront of its operations, but also build a powerful alliance with businesses, governments, schools, parents, all of us can work together to help make this redesign a reality. And so we've run so many different campaigns addressing different issues over the last year. For instance, we called for influencers to not accept endorsements from fast food companies. And this was uh, directing the issue of advertising that we have, um, especially advertise advertisements that are targeted at young people. And so this had a fantastic response the response, it was backed by the likes of David Gandhi and Dr. Alex from Love Island. So that was fantastic. But moving on to trade and what's probably the biggest challenge and the most important campaign that we are going to run is surrounding the post-Brexit trade deals. Uh, we know that over lockdown, young people, like everyone else, have become more aware of the injustice and in, injustice in our food system. Uh, if we look at the campaign that that was run on free school meals. We had Christina also co-chair co on the youth board at Bite Back. Uh, her petition on change.org had over 300,000 signatures on, as she, as she called for the government to provide uh, meals for children who were eligible for free school meals during the school holidays. And after we had Marcus Rashford's open letter calling for a U-turn, that really pushed our campaign into, um, into victory. And so with such a massive win in our back pocket, like I said, the biggest threat to child health right now are these trade deals. Um, everyone's talking about chlorinated chicken, food safety, animal welfare, and environmental, environmental concerns. And we think these are really important, 
but trade deals could be the biggest thing to change the game for young people's health. If we look at Mexico, for example, after they signed um, a trade deal with the US in 1994, their obesity rates had shot, shot up into the air really and became the second highest in the world after the USA. And this was attributed to increased processed foods on, in, on supermarket shelves, additional advertising. We cannot underestimate the, the impact that um, advertisements have on young people. We're so impressionable and it's very easy for us to be influenced. And this was also attributed to the increase in consumption on sugary beverages. If we take Canada as another example, uh, they saw a similar trend, consumption on higher fructose corn syrup, and that's just a type of sugar from cornstarch, rose significantly after its trade with the US. And this rise in high fructose corn syrup consumption was linked to the large rise in obesity rates. Their obesity rates more than doubled in just the space of about 10 years. Um, so we can really see how these trade deals are something that is going to shape the future of young people. Um, and we know that when we're looking at trade deals between the US, we know Trump is very much against any effort to improve food labels as proposed to limit the ability as he proposed to limit the ability of Mexico and Canada and the US. And so a wrong trade deal could really just undermine all the progress that Boris has made with the latest child obesity strategy that he's, um, he's published. And I think Biteback and I welcome the news that Mar Marcus Rashford has formed a task force for some of, with some of the UK's biggest brands, so like Sainsbury's, as he tries to help reduce uh, child poverty I think that's fantastic, but for us at Backpack, it is more than just feeding children. It's about feeding every child food that is healthy and nutritious. A few of our youth leaders talked about their experiences on um, free school meals. One said that her food voucher could only cover um, lunch or break food. So she couldn't decide, she, she couldn't have both. She had to decide which one she would have. Um, another talked about how her food voucher could not access the hot food. So she was forced to have a sandwich every single day for lunch. And for somebody who had a completely different experience of free school meals, it is just, it blows my mind to know that these inequalities still exist. You know, I was somebody who was very dependent on um, free school meals and I know how much of a help that they can be to families and just having parents having not to think about that one meal, it really does mean something, but we need to make sure that the food that we're providing for these children is something, it's food that is going to be nutritious and help them thrive and excel in their education as they grow up to be absolutely amazing people. And so these examples are just a few of that just kind of show the inequality that exists within our food system. And for Bite Back, it's about equal access to healthy food, which both examples kind of highlight. And so I think when we talk about trade deals, it's just very important for us to look at how can we make sure that these trade deals do not undermine any progress that we have made and actually put the health of young people first before anything else. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasha. That was just fantastic. And it's really great to have your optic on it. And we definitely need a lot of you. Um, now, can we um, bring everybody back into the picture? Because we've got lots of questions coming in and lots of um, ideas and things coming in on the chat function. One of the things that seems to be coming from a lot of different people, including, I see Henry's had a go at answering them, and thank you, Henry, from Nikki and various other people. Um, at the simplest level, shouldn't the national curriculum include cookery and nutrition as a core? Um, I think I'll start with you, Henry, because obviously you were the author of the School Food Plan, and I know that along with the school food plan was a lot of stuff about how you shouldn't be able to leave school without being able to eat, to cook a certain number of dishes. Um, what's happened? So we battled to get it in and succeeded to getting in as compulsory in the curriculum and also uh, the, the language, the introduction, as part of their work with food, pupils should be taught how to cook and apply the principles of nutrition and healthy eating, instilling a love of cooking in pupils will open the door to one of the great expressions of human creativity. Learning to cook is a crucial life skill that enables people to feed themselves and others affordably well now and in later life. And we, we fought for that word love in there, which the civil servants tried to take out, and we got it into the curriculum. And there's detail behind that. But it turns out that putting something in the curriculum does not make it taught. So I go around to schools a lot, 
and some are doing it really well and some are still teaching people to cook cupcakes and uh, part of part two will be going back to that and thinking about what system of training status for teachers monitoring etc is required to make that happen you can't you know you can't just pass laws to make things happen it requires a whole host of other things uh to happen too so there's definitely unfinished business for me on cooking in the curriculum i mean there are lots of people there are people on this call i mean i have a charity which i co-founded called chef and schools that does it sarah jane stans is doing it there are lots of examples of excellence dotted around the country but it, I, my, I don't know the numbers, my guess is it's happening well in 10% of schools, and that would probably be optimistic. That's a, ter that's a terrible statistic, that's so little. Um, Tasha, just briefly, can I come to you? Um, what, do you what, what do you see about you know, young people coming out of school with any proper knowledge of what they should eat or what they should cook or not? Mm. I mean, I remember going through school, there was very much, there was very little talked about nutrition and healthy eating. It was always, you know, it's great for you to have your five days, but that was kind of like the, the minimum and the maximum. That was it. So I do think that the education system does play a big role in terms of our knowledge of what is right, what we should be eating, what foods that we should avoid or limit the consumption of. So yeah, they're definitely a big uh, shareholder in this, in this food system. Okay. Um, Question for you, Tim, here, I think, although probably everyone would like to chip in on it. It's just come in from Gordon Anderson. How can we break the stranglehold of the powerful food industry and well-funded lobbying groups? We appear to bend over backwards not to hurt the industry, tinker at the edges. We need cross-government change in education, food retailing, fast food, food delivery. We are spending a fortune on eating badly. I was very struck by you know, what you said about the, the power of the supermarkets, we get all our food from, you know, from five big shops and that actually it's, a, you know, the idea of the diet, yogurt, etc. what an illusion they sell us. How do you see a solution? Um, well, I'm not a politician, as you can probably tell. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I'm not very successful at uh, getting to it, but I think the first thing to do is to get the word out there about how out of sync we are um, to the population and, and shift the mainstream uh, view on this so that they don't regard just having a, you know, supermarkets with 30,000 products in it as the only uh, idea that we're, you know, we're a, a, a country that has good food. Um, but we do, I think there are a few battles that are worth fighting here and uh, you know, and it could be that the sugar tax, for example, uh, becomes our sort of clarion call to expand that to junk foods. And I do think, you know, we've got to start somewhere and work outwards uh, in the same way that we, we took on the, sh the smoking lobby. Um, and, you know, we know their tactics uh, and, we, you know, we're, and we're starting to, to beat against the fuel lobby on the environment it's just by picking away at some of these things that they regard as uh, sacrosanct so the idea that you can't penalize bad food um, you know we've been taxing alcohol and cigarettes uh, for a long time and so I think something simple as just saying okay well let's just have a very focused campaign to expand the sugar tax which was surprisingly effective um, in in changing what the industry was serving up to people. I mean, whether it's going to make people, uh, you know, it certainly helped children's teeth um, and we hope it's going to have other effects. But I think other countries have done this and uh, we need to look also nationally at what's, what's worked. Changing food labels, um, you know, again, like the cigarette lobby, you know, eventually we started to say, well, we're not going to get the cigarette companies to design their own labels. Uh, we've got to take that over and I think these are these are some of the things that can change habits in children. Chile have gone to a black spot on all ultra processed food you know none of this complicated system you just have a black spot says this stuff is bad for you and but to do that you know we need campaigners we need uh, all the political parties 
uh, to actually get involved and say this is so crucial to us that we should all be doing this as a cross-party action. We can no longer just afford to keep taking the money from the food industry because uh, it's killing us. And it's, you know, it's not economical. They, they can build as many biscuit factories as they like in uh, you know, some MP's backyard, but the cost of diabetes and obesity is going to you know, consume us all. Thank you very much for that. Um, I just want to come to Dee and then Henry, I will come to you and ask you what the food strategy can do about that. But Dee, I mean, when you're, um, I mean, I was very struck by something. I know someone who works in a care home and they had a terrible time through COVID. But when East, about a week after Easter, there were 45 people in this care home and Mars delivered 364 Mars Easter eggs, complete with sweets inside because they had a whole lot left over. And it was sort of, the only thing that was actually given to this care home, which did avoid COVID all the way through. Everything else was really tough for them. So do you see when you're you know, at the cold face like you are that the food that ends up um, in the food parcels is healthy, not healthy? Um, so we tend to get a lot of rubbish and I don't send out rubbish. I, I insist, you know, that the charities we are working with, the supermarkets that we do work with, that we get real food, healthy food, fresh vegetables, cooking ingredients. Um, if we do have to get canned or ambient food, that it is good food. I refuse to send out rubbish. So a lot of time, you know, that, that ends up in the bin. And that's one of the things that a lot of people do not see is that food aid pro projects end up with a huge waste bill yeah having know. to get rid of rubbish and does it um really continue to upset you the fact that this end of life you know where people that don't have any food is still completely in the hands of charities and people like marcus Rashford, um, right to make yes it, it is and um, for me you know people have a right to live in dignity and should have agency to have choice about what they eat. And for a large and increasing number of people, they don't have that. And I agree with what Tim has said. And part of that for me is us creating those alternatives mm -hmm. by building those community systems, those localized food systems, um, that would also create jobs, but it's also about education as well that goes beyond schools and into communities. Um, okay. we, we really need to think. We really need to think about how things are interconnected, but we cannot keep eating cheap food. We cannot keep dumping cheap food on, onto you know, people who are underserved because it is killing us, it is killing our planet. Um, thank you, Dee. Um, Henry, I mean, in terms of all the things that, you know, Tim was saying about the power of the supermarkets, the illusions of healthy food, etc. What, where can the food strategy start to intervene in that? And supplementary question, how are the supermarkets taking your work? Because I know you deal with them a lot. Well, interesting, I don't think the supermarkets are the biggest part of the problem. But there is definitely a problem. And what I've, in part one, I started to describe just the inevitable link between the fact that highly nutritious dense food, dense food was rare and therefore we love it and we are involved to eat it. And it's easier to sell to us and that companies sell more of it to us. So, you know, if you look at the portfolios of the fast moving consumer goods brands, those who sell processed food. It is full of food that, it, that would be defined as not good for you by anyone's standards. And that's just an inevitability of the combination of the market, free market and our evolution. And I then talked about how therefore, and I quoted uh, actually the supermarkets are more keen on this than the fast food consumer goods. You need to have some form of government intervention. I made the argument for advertising bans, uh, and I, I, I rehearsed the advertising for sugar tax, which interestingly didn't put up the price at all. It just shifted mass and sugar out of the product. And so I think there needs to be, uh, the, the system is not going to correct itself. And the question then is, what are the interventions that the government makes? And how do you ensure that they are both 
have the right outcomes and don't create unintended consequences. And a big part of the work that I'm doing for part two is commissioning um, work specifically on tax, mm -hmm. as well as other things. But I, I think there is the, the, the sugar intervention. Tax is basically just a way of building in the externality, the negative externalities that we're talking about. And I think we definitely need to think about where that goes to next. Because what happens is it makes people, the companies, be innovative about how they make things that don't contain that stuff in it. doesn't just, it's a nonsense that it's regressive and it just makes things more expensive to mm -hmm. people who are less happy. It just, there's just no evidence of that. What happens is companies make other stuff and sell us other things. You see what happens with this advertising ban. What will happen is two things. The fast moving consumer goods companies, Nestle, P&G, they will advertise stuff that isn't terrible for our health to us. And the second thing they'll do is they'll reformulate so there's less yeah. uh, saturated fat, highly processed carbs, sugar in their products. So I think, you I think you need more government intervention. The CEOs of Sainsbury's and Tesco's do, Roger Whiteside from Greg's does, the people who really struggle. And someone said uh, that the first response from one of these food uh, membership organizations is, why does Henry hate business so much? I don't hate business. I just pointed out that there are certain things that make us all as businessmen, and anyone who's founded a business knows the temptation, do things you wish you didn't have to do or be tempted to do because you're worried that otherwise you'll go bust and won't be able to feed your family. So I think, there is, I think Tim is absolutely spot on. And I don't think it's saying that business is bad. I just think that the free market has changed our food system in a way that is not good for us or, as Dee says, the planet. Thank you. Um, question here for Tasha specifically. Um, are there any particular trade deals that Bite Back is very worried about and why? Um, not at the moment, because um, it's all kind of new. Um, but I think the point, the, the stand that Bite Back take, take is just making sure that whatever trade deal that we have um, is one that really does focus on young people's health. Um, but one that we have the most concern for is any trade deal that we get out of the US. Um, I think somebody mentioned if that was the only trade deal that we're focused on, it's because it is the one that's likely to have the biggest impact. We're likely to have companies that are willing to spend millions on advertising and we are able to see the impact that advertising will have in terms of the consumer choices that people will make after that. Um, we're, gonna, we're likely to see increased processed foods on our, on our shelves, foods that are high in fat, salt and sugar, a lot of import in terms of food wise that we get come from the US. So they are honestly the biggest game player in all of this and probably probably our biggest concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm really sorry we've got lots of wonderful questions and I, I know Henry's been answering some online. We'll try and answer them, but I'm afraid we're more or less now out of time. So I'm going to take a, a question here which was going to be similar to my wrap up question. This is from Nina. And she has said, what can we as individuals do to affect positive change? Um, and I wondered if you could just, in a sense, go down the line. I mean, Tim, what would you say to that? And I mean, in a way also, where do you see reasons to be optimistic if indeed you do see any? Well, you know, things have got bad in some areas, but in others, I'm seeing uh, healthy products, you know, being endorsed faster than ever and people talking about gut microbes and gut health in the last few years that wouldn't be possible at all. So people are now talking about foods in a different way, in informed debate. And I think things like polyphenols in foods and this idea of having 30 different plants a day. And I think if everyone started talking about food in different ways and not just fats and calories and whatever, talked about all the good things in it, the positives, and how everyone can actually get out there because we have got, most people do have choice, uh, then I think we can start to impact that and change people's opinions. To just looking at food in a different way uh, and start, start saying that everything we eat is plastic if it comes from plants and it's not heavily manufactured and they've all got you know, enormous benefits and we should try and maximize that diversity and, and spread the word about that. And I think that would do a lot of good uh, around. Thank you. Um, Henry, what, what would be your answer to what we can do as individuals and what you see, what makes you feel positive? So I think with Tim, I, I do feel that 
even though we don't have the solutions, these issues which were 10 years ago viewed as the domain of hippies and lunatics <laughs> are now accepted as the, the problems of diet-related health, environmental destruction and climate change, of which food production is a massive part, mm. are accepted by almost everyone as genuine problems that we need to resolve. And that is not a non-trivial yep. thing. Um, in terms of how people can help, it would really help. I want to create, to, to use the food strategy as part of creating a movement as well, to create these conversations uh, across the country, to create pressure on food systems, not just through central government. As someone said in the chat, central government can't imprison a head teacher if they don't teach uh, food right. So we need pressure from bottom up as well as top down. So anyone who wants to get involved, please do go to the nationalfoodstrategy.org website, put it on the chat and sign up and uh, we will hopefully try and give you ways to just start changing the food system in your area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dee? Can you unmute? Oh, yeah. I, was, I, I would say be of service to your community. Um, we need to build on that solidarity of mutual aid and come together to co-create solutions. I'm a big believer in bottom-up solutions and including the people most affected and a lot of those conversations are happening right now so find your nearest food aid project community project um, this is beyond politics this is about our humanity thank you and Tasha um, I think what gives me hope is just seeing the amount of people having these conversations um, this was probably unheard of Five, 10 years ago uh, definitely helps seeing you know people with large platforms really talking about issues that young people are facing uh, the likes of Marcus Rashford of course um, and I think what people can do is continue to have these conversations and make sure that they do not stop until we see the change that we want to see uh, whether that is with your peers or with um, your colleagues or schools and government whatever way that you can use to really voice your opinion definitely utilize it Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to answer questions. I see Carmel McConnell from the wonderful Magic Breakfast is there saying that uh, breakfast needs the Marcus Rashford treatment and lots of people emailing in about emphasis on growing your own food within communities that I'm sure we'd all agree with and I certainly endorse. But in the meantime, um, thank you all very much for joining us. There have been tons of people online. Uh, we've got about 400 participants and they will spread the word. And thank you for joining Five by 15. Please come back for our next event, which is next week, I think. It's very soon. And uh, look online because we have wonderful events. And a huge thank you to Tasha, to Dee, to Henry and to Tim and to all of you at home. Um, good night. <laughs>